gentlemen. I would like to thank Andy Jepson and Archaeology Scotland for inviting me here to tell you about my great-grandfather, George Patterson Sutherland, my grandfather, David Sutherland, and my uncle, George Stuart Sutherland, who together made the firm of George Sutherland and Sons, sculptors and monumental masons, which ran for 118 years in Gallows Shields. Crossing over two world wars, the family history epitomises Scottish social history. Emigrations across the empire, a company rising and falling across three generations, and the toll of wars. I hope I can explain today why I'm so proud of their achievements. George Patterson Sutherland was born in 1852, the son of a master mason, David Sutherland, of Tobago Road, Edinburgh. Educated at George Heriot School in Edinburgh in 1867, he was apprenticed for five years to a stonemason and carver. He worked in America, I think on the Vanderbilt Mansion, and his work journal showed that in 1874, he was carving stonework on the mansion at St. Leonard's Hill in Windsor for Sir Francis Barry. George decided to move to Galashiels, where the tweed mills and accompanying shrinking and dyeing industries made this a thriving working town with a growing population. Very important to a man starting his own business. In fact, at the 1851 Great Exhibition in London, the largest number of tweed exhibitors had come from Gala Mills. Local manufacturers were building mansions for themselves, so a stone carver would be a greatly prized asset to the town. George's first commission were the gateposts and the carving above the door at Dry Grange House for Edward William Sprott, whose gravestone he was later to carve in 1898. According to his obituary in 1943 in the Board of Telegraph, a local lady observing him carving was heard to quote, this poor soul's made an awful mistake. There's no work here for the likes of him. I'll give him a month. <laughs> this just spurred him on to work harder, quoting, I'll oh, show the beggars. Okay. Impressed with this work, the borough council asked George to design a sewer plumes coat of arms for the borough chamber, showing the legend from 1337 when invading English were overwhelmed and killed by local men when discovered eating unripe plums. In 1881, George married Helen Wilson MacDonald in Islington, and they started a family which would carry the firm almost to the year 2000. First born in 1882 was Agnes MacDonald Sutherland, known as Nanny, then David Sutherland in 1884, George MacDonald Sutherland in 1886, Norman Jane Sutherland in 1890, and finally Eleanor Patterson Sutherland in 1903. By now, George had purchased premises in Albert Place, next to the borough chambers called The Yard by the family. The showroom was obliquely set to the road with a classical facade and a marble nameplate stating Monumental Sculptor G. Sutherland above stained glass windows. In addition, there was an office, a lettering shed, and a low vaulted room under the office where a camera and darkroom were housed. Glass plates of photographs were developed of headstones, either in the showroom prior to erection or in situ in cemeteries after erection. All these glass plates are now cared for at the Hoyt Heritage Hub. The cobbled area outside had a gantry and crane for lifting heavy stones, including sandstone, also known as freestone, granite, and marble. Impressed by his work in the coat of arms, the Borough Council commissioned George to design the exterior carvings on the imposing new post office in Chatham Street. This grand classical sandstone building was decorated with intricately carved panels of flora and fauna, the date of 1894, and post office, proudly displayed above the imposing front door. George took photographs of the postmaster, the clerk of works, his master masons George Boyd and Bob Jeffrey, and his three sons, David, George, and Norman, proudly standing or sitting amongst the panels before they were transported to the post office site lifted and set into position. His main business was now ornately carved headstones. To entice in customers, he needed to demonstrate trends and show examples giving a tangible three-dimensional illustration of what kind of sculpting, sculpting could be designed and created. Between 1881 and about 1910, George attended the sales and auctions of Scottish sculptures and purchased marble sculptures, busts, maquettes and plaster casts of famous sculptures to display in his showroom. He commissioned an architect to build a sandstone house, Beechwood, on the Lawyer's Bray, where the family could look directly down into their business 
creating beautiful works of art for over 100 years and providing a living for a family. By 1900, the yard was doing well. David was 16, an apprentice to the business. George was 14 and Norman was 10. However, George MacDonald Sutherland, the middle son, did not see his future in the business. He had observed his father's drawings, the designs full of architectural content and influence, detail and scale displayed in his careful workmanship. Having completed his education at George Watson School in Edinburgh, in 19, January 1903, he and his father paid a visit to an address at 49 Queen Street, Edinburgh. By return on 19th January 1903, George Patterson Sutherland received a letter from the most eminent Scottish architect of the day, Sir Robert Lorimer. Dear Sir, referring to your call at my office with your son and Mr Scott, I write to say that I am not keeping on my present boy, as my clerk does not think he is shaping well. I would therefore be glad to give your son a trial for, say, two months. I take them on the understanding that if the trial months are satisfactory, they stay for a four years apprenticeship, but I do not bind them. I give them five pounds the first year, 10 pounds the second, 15 pounds the third, and 20 pounds the fourth. As I explained to you on Friday, it is quite useless a boy going into a job such as architecture unless he has a real liking for it and is also willing to work hard and devote his whole time to it. If your son comes to me, I will expect him to do his very best. And as I have a large amount of interesting work in the office, it will be his own fault if he does not pick up knowledge quickly. <laughs> Please send me a sample of his handwriting, and if you agree to the above terms, I would like him to start work on Monday morning next. Yours, R.S. Lorimer. George started immediately with Sir Robert Lorimer, and after his first four-year after his four-year apprenticeship was practicing as a qualified architect by 1907. While training, he captured the carving and stone decoration on the arches, cloisters, scrolls, and bosses of Melrose Abbey in tremendous detail, a symbiotic link with the stone carving of his father's business. With astounding care, he drew the carvings on George Heriot's, the school his father had attended, the intricate tracery on a Tudor carved oak cabinet of 1540, and wrought iron gates at St John's College, the Old School's Quadrangle, and the Clarendon Press in Oxford. I also found architectural drawings for houses he had drawn for Lorimer as his apprenticed architect. He moved to 147A Earls Court Road in London, where he worked in Kensington for a time. However, with an empire and opportunities abroad, George, with four other architectural friends, emigrated to Toronto in Canada. A contemporary of Mackintosh, Lutyens, Lloyd Wright, Le Corbusier, and Art Nouveau architects, the world was his oyster. This was the era, era of Pennsylvania Station and the Woolworth Building in New York, Gaudi's Casa Mila in Barcelona, Hill House in Helensborough, and the Arts and Crafts Architects led by William Morris. By 1911, Toronto had over 300,000 residents and Canada's change from a British colony to a self-governing nation was being reflected in an architectural revolution as shown in George's Toronto exhibition catalogues. The first architecture school at a Canadian university had opened in 1896 in McGill. What amazing times for George. He set up a practice in Toronto, bought land in the city to develop. His future was secure in Canada. Meanwhile in Scotland, Exposing his sons to new designs and ideas, George sent first David to America and then Norman, who left on 2nd May 1914. They went to art school and to work in a sculptor's business in New York called Adler's. Contemporaries of Eric Gill, Jacob Epstein, the Pre-Raphaelite, Singer Sergeant in Cubism, the boys could engage in the new sculptures and art whilst improving their drawing and stone carving skills amongst the new thrusting skyscrapers. In the years leading up to the cataclysmic First World War, art and design was exponentially overflowing from Europe and the New World. Headstones continue to be designed for customers. The Victorian monuments depicting sombre obelisks, either plainly pointed with urns atop or even urns draped in fabric carved in stone, were cast aside and rejected for the new simpler, plainer, neoclassical monuments with simple lettering some even built into the cemetery walls. New styles of art, design and architecture were sweeping in and the firm's headstones reflected this. 
Ornate crosses began to be more favoured, harking back to a more Pictish and early Scots influence with the rise in nationalism early in the 20th century. Patufa and Marjorie Kennedy Fraser were collecting traditional Gaelic working songs from the highlands and islands of Scotland as they saw the unstoppable march of modernism eroding the Gaelic ways of the past and the exodus of <coughs> islanders to jobs on the mainland. Robert Lorimer designed the Thistle Chapel in St Giles Cathedral in Edinburgh in 1911. The harking back to Scottish roots created the need to look more inwardly as a nation, hence the more wistful retrospective of Celtic stirp designs on stones. Meanwhile, George Patterson Sullivan's business and personal position in Gala Shields was becoming well established. He was elected to the town council in 1901, became a magistrate from 1902 to 1912, was provost from 1912 to 1915, and after the Great War was elected onto the War Memorial Committee of 1919 to 1925. In 1903, the town council purchased the corn mill, demolished it, and widened the streets in the vicinity. Located at the confluence of a culverted burn and the historic mill laid, the ensuing fountain is a prominent and important feature of early 20th century improvement of Gala Shields. Now a listed building, the architect of these fountains was none other than Sir Robert Lorimer. Is it a coincidence that George Patterson Sutherland was elected onto the town council by 1902, the year before the site was purchased? His son was employed by Lorimer by 1903, and Lorimer became the architect for the whole site, including the placings of the statues of Scott and Burns, whose plinths were sculpted by the, by the Sutherlands. Does this not show a collaborative link with design, sculpture and architecture between these two men? The Scott Memorial Fountain was opened in 1913 with the Border Telegraph issuing a special edition with photographs of George Patterson Sutherland and his wife Helen, the provost and his wife. By 1914, the business in Gallic Shields was thriving. David was 30, Norman was 24 and George in Toronto was 28. Their father, George P, remaining at the helm, would soon be in great demand carving headstones for fallen soldiers. David was called up into the King's own Scottish borderers and Norman into the territorial force. Taking his horse soldier with him, Lieutenant David Sutherland served in the Camel Corps and fought with a Salonica force in Mesopotamia, Gagri in Georgia on the Black Sea, Russia, Palestine and the Dardanelles. Meanwhile in Canada, expats had a moral decision to make. George MacDonald Sutherland wanted to come back and fight for his country. My uncle told me the family tried to dissuade him, advising that he was safe in Canada, but the pull of the motherland was too much. Enlisting as a lieutenant into the 4th King's own Scottish borderers, after training, George was sent to France, where he was killed by a shell on 9th April 1917, on the first day of the Arras Offensive. He was finally buried in the Cabaret Rouge British Cemetery at Suchet, just north of Arras. <coughs> the lands he had bought in Toronto were sold and the funds transferred back to Agnes and Eleanor. His family kept his architectural drawings, which I donated to the Lorimer Collection at the University of Edinburgh Library, where the keeper of special collections, Graham Eddy, created a blog of his life and drawings under the topic Untold Stories. Life had to go on, and later in 1917, on 3rd September, David Sutherland married <coughs> Lee Stuart Dow, the daughter of a wool agent from Perthshire who had moved to the borders. One of her brothers, Alec, had emigrated to Canada, and the other, John, became managing director of Titus Salt's Mill at Saltaire in Yorkshire. Both her sisters, Jean and Mary, were teachers. Mary married a naval engineer, Nelson Stratford, who was going out to Calcutta to build the George V dock, and they lived in Calcutta for 24 years, coming back on his retirement on the convoys in 1944. David and Lily had three children. George Stuart Sutherland was born in 1918, John MacDonald Sutherland in 1921, and my mother, Jean Elizabeth Sutherland, in 1929. Both sons carried the names of their uncle, George MacDonald Sutherland, whom they had never met. The third generation of Sutherlands was born to continue the business forwards. With a catastrophic loss of life in the Great War, George Patterson Sutherland was elected onto the War Memorial Committee. He had spoken eloquently <coughs> while provost in 1915 when he declared open the new public baths in Gala Shields, quoting from letters home from young men serving abroad who were asking how progress was going with the new pool. But alas, those who would have used it 
now lie dead at Gallipoli. Having already designed the fountain, the War Memorial Committee approached Sir Robert Lorimer to design a war memorial. Based on a border peel tower, the effective design stands imposing in the centre of Galashiels with a stirring statue of a border weaver by Thomas Clapperton. David, my grandfather, was commissioned to design the Angel of Peace, and my great-grandfather carved the arch above it. When lit from underneath, shadows are thrown up from the shoulders of the angel and form poignant angel's wings above. Although lost in recent years due to modern streeting, street lighting, a Galashiels gentleman, Murray Dixon, who runs the old Gala Club and who was taught by my great aunt Eleanor, suggested that the effect be recreated. On 11th November 2011 at 6 p.m., the town lights were dimmed for the Angel's Wings ceremony. So popular, this is now part of the annual remembrance ceremony for Gallus Fallen, taking place on the nearest Friday to Armistice Day at 6 p.m. The bells peel out the first line of Raw Brawl Lads, bells donated by Archie Cochrane, a mill owner in Gallus Shields, in memory of his three sons who fell in the First World War. Some historians say the Gallows Shields War Memorial is one of the finest in Scotland. <coughs> On 4th October 1925, Earl Haig unveiled the War Memorial. In the special edition of the Border Telegraph, my grandfather is shown standing on the steps of Beechwood in uniform. One cannot think how hard it must have been to have carved an angel on an edifice designed by Lorimer, the architect who had taught your brother, and on whose roll of honour your own brother's name is written. <coughs> In a Pyrrhic victory, the yard was busier than ever, with an order book full of stones for fallen men. Whether a simple war graves commission stone or a more elaborate one for grieving parents, the decorations and inscriptions carved by the Sutherlands did sensitive service to those lost men. It was clear that new premises must be found to provide for all the new orders coming in. So in 1922, the firm bought over Robson's Sequoia, renaming it George Sutherland and Sons with Norman managing the business. Soon the commissioning of war memorials would provide the business with much more work, with memorials and crosses of all styles being erected across the borders, many designs in collaboration with Lorimer. Each town and small village had a tribute on their fallen son, to their fallen sons, Bowden, Lily's Leaf, Stow, Linton, Moorbattle, Melrose, Yetham, Lauder, Kelso, Ancrum, Selkirk, and so many more. George Sutherland and Sons now had a monopoly over the whole borders. In February 1928, George, David, and Norman were invited to a dinner of the Edinburgh and District Master Monumental Sculptors Association, where George is presented with Lawrence Weaver's book, Memorials and Monuments, as a token of their high esteem and as a memento of the occasion of his being made the first honorary member of the association with all those present signing the frontispiece of the book. Also in 1928, the request came through for a huge Trimontium stone at Newstead near Melrose to mark the settlement as a Roman garrison. The fort was designed to be reminiscent of a Roman gravestone or steel. My two uncles are pictured with the stonemason, and my grandfather is seated at the front of the inaugural photograph. The order book was full with headstones for the everyday man and his wife and children, and also the great and the good of the borders. The Sutherlands were approached by the families of the Maxwell Scots of Abbotsford, Sir William Ramsay Fairfax, Bart of Maxton, Lord Somerville, Lord Strangsteel of Philip Hock, and the Pringles, who were the lairds of Gala, to name but a few, and their stones were sub often surprisingly modest. Designs were drawn out for all society. Even those who had died abroad had inscriptions added to family stones. To me, this one sad stone epitomizes their work. In memory of Annie Robertson, the loved wife of James Miller, who died 15th January 1907 in her 38th year. Also their children, James, who died 29th April 1903, aged 16 months. Robert, who died 28th December 1903, aged one month. And Robert, who died 19th January 1907, aged two weeks. Imagine coming into the yard to order a headstone to commemorate your three children and your wife who had died in childbirth four days before your last son died. Great sensitivity was needed from the Sutherlands when customers needed emotional strength. 
Designs will be discussed in a quiet office, depending on the preferred style and budget. Books of photographs and illustrations showing a range of styles would be shown, and a design including lettering would be sent to the customer for approval. Times in those days were hard, and on many occasions, my mother told me, the family would not disclose the full cost, the firm quietly paying the difference. I am very proud of that kindness and sensitivity shown by my predecessors. Once the design and lettering was drawn onto the chosen stone, it was moved into the lettering shed for carving. There, amid the warm glow from the cast iron fine fire, with coffee pots warming on the metal, <coughs> men would sit in front of the stones with leather aprons and carefully hammer out the V-cut letters with finely tooled chisels. Watching Burke work in the 1960s, I was amazed at the speed with which he could chisel out letters, never wavering in the degree of angle. Freestone and pale granite lettering was painted in black lead paint. Red and black granite was painted in gold, which made the stone look grand and distinguished. Any lead paint brushed by mistake onto the polished granite surface was rushed off, rushed, rubbed off with a cuttlefish bone. Marble lettering had tiny peg holes drilled further into each V-cut letter. Shaped lead letters would be hammered with a wooden mallet into the drilled holes and the excess trimmed. The lead letters, secured underneath by the drilled pegs and standing slightly proud of the marble, were then carefully painted with black lead paint. By now the volume of work needed more mechanised equipment, and new sheds were built on the right-hand side of the yard for the new steam-powered engine to saw the blocks of stone and also the marble polishing machinery. I remember hearing the swish swish of the steam-driven saw echoing around Gala. Advertisements for the firm boasted the latest machinery showing they were keeping up with modern technology and innovative engineering. My uncle George entered the business in 1934, aged 16, and began his drawing apprenticeship. In 1942, my other uncle John, then 21, entered for his City and Guild certificate offering carving. A special examiner had to be brought over for the invigilation, where John painted onto canvas graceful boughs and acanthus leaves, and then carved them from plaster. For this show of design and craftsmanship, John was awarded the bronze medal, and a small piece was written up in the Border Telegraph. The following year, in 1943, the family bought a business in Tweedmouth for John to run. Their grandfather would have been very proud that the boys were shaping up so well. The firm had now been running for 62 years, and when he died, aged 93, in 1943, his obituary in the Border Telegraph stated that George Sutherland and Sons was the foremost monumental sculptor in the south of Scotland. During the Second World War, George was saved from being called up as the monumental mason's business was a reserved occupation. John, at 21, was eager to join up and get into the fray. His father, having lost a brother in the First World War, did not want to lose a son in the second. After training, John was enlisted into the Cameron Highlanders and was sent to Europe with a signal corps. Involved in the Allied Alliance advance across the Rhine on 28 March 1945, while driving ahead to lay signal cables, his jeep went over a landmine. Lieutenant John MacDonald Sutherland was 23 when he died. John was buried at the Rifold Forest War Cemetery, a long way from the Scottish hills of home, but surrounded by other young men who had lost their lives in the struggle for peace. A second killed in action inscription had to be chiselled onto the family headstone. A second name had to be added to the Gallishills War Memorial Tablet, adjacent to that of his uncle he had never known, and underneath the angel of peace his father had carved. The business bought for John in Tweedmouth was managed by George Wilson from Berwick for the family until it was sold in 1986. Norman ran the Hoyt branch until he retired, dying in 1963, aged 73. My grandfather David retired, handing the reins on to my uncle George, and died in 1964, aged 80. My mother, Jean, a teacher, moved to London in the 50s, where she worked as a journalist with a lifelong love of literature, poetry, art, and music. She died in 2011, midway through a PhD in researching undiscovered music of border estates during the Enlightenment. George continued to run the business alone, supported by the craftsmen who had carved and erected stones for his father and for him. He had an encyclopedic knowledge of all the stones they had made across border cemeteries. When Murray Dixon asked him how he knew which were his stones, he pulled the grass away at the, base, at the back of the base of the stone to show the Sutherland name carved. 
Well, we have to advertise somehow, he chuckled. The firm kept all their drawings and order books now at the Hoy Cub, so there was a constant reference bank when additional inscriptions needed to be added or stones cleaned and letters repainted. Styles changed and modernised and George always listened, guided and helped with sensitive advice. Gradually through the 1980s and 90s, the craftsmen began to retire, with no one coming forward to take their place. Instead of Ruber's law quarry granite coming in to be cut, carved and lettered, George could send through his design drawings and the layout of the lettering to Robertson's of Aberdeen, and the finished stones would arrive by lorry, all ready for erecting on Fridays in the cemeteries. In 1999, 118 years after the firm had been founded, George retired aged 80, having spent 64 years of his life at the yard, which was sold and the contents and records moved either to their house Abbots Now or to the Hoyt Hub. Four years later, George died aged 84, ending a Sutherland dynasty, a unique and golden age of carved embellishment on stone, the like of which we will not see again. The legacy of all three generations of the Sutherland family are all around us, from the post office to the angel of peace, the sewer plumes coat of arms and plinths for statues of Scott and Burns. The yard, a listed site, has been repurchased and is currently being given a new lease of life within the original infrastructure. The planned town trail will take visitors past Sutherland carvings and down to their many stones and monuments at Eastland Cemetery. In addition, the myriad of war memorials and headstones across the borders in the south of Scotland celebrate and recognise not only people's sacrifice, lives and families, but also celebrate the art, designs and skilled carving of the firm of George Sutherland and Sons, sculptors, 